Section 01 of Anti Imperialist Writings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. Anti Imperialist Writings by Mark Twain. Mark Twain, Home Again. Newspaper article from the New York Times, October 16, 1900. Mark Twain, Home Again. Writer reaches America after his prolonged stay abroad. Greeted by many friends. Talks freely of his travels, his experiences, and his triumphs in the best of health. Mark Twain returned to America yesterday on the Atlantic Transport Line steamship Minnehaha. As is well known, Mark Twain registers at hotels and signs checks under the name of Samuel M. Clemens, but it was the writer and lecturer Mark Twain who attracted to the pier so many friends and associates of former days. Mr. Clemens never looked better, was in a splendid humor, and greeted his friends with the most affectionate cordiality. As soon as the author had finished with the salutations of his friends, he was surrounded by a large number of newspaper men, and asked for a story of what he had been doing during all the nine years of his absence from his native land. Now, that's a long story, but I suppose I must give you something, even if it is in a condensed form, he said. I left America June 6, 1891, and I went to Aix-les-Bains, France, where I spent the fall and winter. After that I went to Berlin, where I lectured, giving readings from my works. After this, my next stop was the Riviera, where I remained for three months, going from there to the baths near Frankfurt, where I remained during the cholera season. Most of 1892 I spent at Florence, where I rented a home. While there I wrote Joan of Arc, and finished up Puddinghead Wilson. For the next two years I was in France. I can't speak French yet. In the spring of 1895 I came to the United States for a brief stay, crossing the continent from New York to San Francisco, lecturing every night. In October of that year I sailed from Vancouver for Sydney, where I lectured, or, more properly speaking, gave readings from my works to the English-speaking people. I also visited Tasmania and New Zealand. This was at the time of the famous Venezuelan message of President Cleveland, and it did my heart good to see that the animosities engendered by that message did not affect the affection of a people in a strange land for me. I then proceeded to India, lecturing in Ceylon, Bombay, and Calcutta. I then sailed for South Africa, arriving at Delagoa Bay in April 1896. In South Africa I visited Kimberley, Johannesburg, and finally Cape Town. I met Oom Paul. I had heard and read all about him. Hat, beard, frock coat, pipe, and everything else. The picture is a true likeness. At this time the Jameson Raiders were in jail, and I visited them and made a little speech trying to console them. I told them of the advantages of being in jail. This jail is as good as any other, I said, and besides, being in jail has its advantages. A lot of great men have been in jail. If Bunyan had not been put in jail, he would never have written Pilgrim's Progress. Then the jail is responsible for Don Quixote. So you see, being in jail is not so bad, after all. Finally, I told them that they ought to remember that many great men had been compelled to go through life without ever having been in jail. Some of the prisoners didn't seem to take much to the joke, while others seemed much amused. All this time my family was with me, and after a short stay at Cape Town, we took a steamer for Southampton. On arriving in England we went to Guilford, where I took a furnished house, remaining two months, after which for ten months our home was in London. All this time I was lecturing, reading, or working hard in other ways, writing magazine stories and doing other literary work. After London came Vienna, to which city we went in September 1898, remaining until May of the following year in order to allow one of my daughters to take music lessons from a man who spelled his name Leschewtisky. He had plenty of identification, you see, 
and withal seemed to be a pretty smart fellow. After Vienna, where, by the way, I had a lot of fun watching the Reichstrat, we returned to London, in which city and Sweden we have been until our departure for home some days ago, and now I am home again, and you have got the history of a considerable part of my life. Well, everybody's glad you are back, which you know, of course. They gave you the courtesy of the port, didn't they? An intensely interested listener remarked. Yes, I wrote to Secretary Gage, telling him that my baggage was on a 16,000-ton ship, which was quite large enough to accommodate all I had, which, while it consisted of a good many things, was not good enough to pay duty on, yet too good to throw away. I accordingly suggested that he write the customs people to let it in, as I thought they would be more likely to take his word than mine. "'How about your plans?' he was asked. "'I am absolutely unable to speak of my plans,' he replied, "'inasmuch as I have none, and I do not expect to lecture.' At this point the question of anti-imperialism was broached, someone asking, "'How are you on expansion? Are you for the President, or are you with those that style themselves anti-imperialists?' "'Yes. As near as I can find out, I think that I am an anti-imperialist. I was not, though, until some time ago, for when I first heard of the acquisition of the present Pacific possessions, I thought it a good thing for a country like America to release those people from a bondage of suffering and oppression that had lasted three hundred years. But when I read the Paris Treaty, I changed my mind. "'You are going to vote for Mr. Bryan, then, are you?' was the query put to him by another bystander. No, I'm a mugwump. I don't know who I'm going to vote for. I must look over the field. Then, you know, I've been out of the country a long time. I might not be allowed to register. You are still a citizen of the United States, are you not? interposed a member of the party. Well, I guess I am. I've been paying taxes on this side for the last nine years. I believe, though, a man can run for president, laughingly inquired Mr. Clemens, without a vote, can't he? If this is so, why, then I am a candidate for president. Dropping anti-imperialism, Mr. Clemens made the plea that he had been away so long that he really knew very little on the subject, as all of his information had practically been gleaned from foreign papers. Someone in the crowd asked him about his autobiography that is to be published one hundred years hence. It is true I am writing it, he said. That's not a joke, is it? No. I said it seriously. That's why they take it as a joke. You know, I never told the truth in my life that someone didn't say I was lying, while, on the other hand, I never told a lie that somebody didn't take it as a fact. Well, it's not wrong, anyway, to tell a lie sometimes, is it? was a question someone asked in a very conciliatory way. That's right. Exactly right. If you can disseminate facts by telling the truth, why, that's the way to do it. And if you can't, except by doing a little lying, well, that's all right, too, isn't it? Well, I do it. Mr. Clemens had become very restless by this time, and the many friends surrounding him on the pier managed to rescue him from the clutches of the newspaper men, who had been firing questions at him since he first appeared on the pier. I'll see you again. I'll be at the Earlington all the winter. I am not going to Hartford till next year. And with a pleasant nod of the head, the famous writer, accompanied by his friends, began a search for his baggage. End of Mark Twain, Home Again Recording by John Greenman